Today we're going to go over the, the you know, the, the, the structure of the course, um, that sort of thing, typical things. Many of you have probably had me for other courses, and this course is structured very similar to most of the courses uh, that I teach. We'll also get into sort of an overview of the content, uh, depending on time, and we'll probably talk a little bit about the first lab assignment which is really sort of an icebreaker just to, to get things going and get you familiar with Visual Studio if you uh, are not uh, already familiar with it. I do record the lectures, um, which um, I, I guess I'm going to put a little disclaimer on. Um, the, the quality of the recording isn't great. Um, and I try to compensate for that by also uploading the files. So, for example, if I go over an example um, in class, um, it might be hard to see on the screen, but I will upload the file. So it usually works best if you download the file and look at the fi actual file while watching the video. Now, to be sure, sometimes that can be a little confusing because I may make changes to the file throughout the lecture, but it, it, it is generally the better way to go. Um, the idea is, is if there's something that you're confused on, you can rewatch it, or if you miss, miss a class, at least you have that going. Um, so I think it's helpful. Um, if, it's, if it's not helpful at all for you, then it's no worse off than if I didn't record them. Just don't watch them if it's not helpful for you, you know. It's unfortunate uh, to put it in those terms, but um, it, it is, uh, I, I do wish they were better quality. But again, hopefully at least you'll get some. Um, something out of them if you would have to miss class or we watch them. Um, I assume everyone's familiar with Canvas, so I won't really be going over that. I'll be talking about how this course is structured within Canvas. Um, all right. Introduction, and I think it takes me less time each time, probably because I'm bored with going over it, or I've I've already thought I've talked about something or other or whatever. So um, hopefully um, that won't happen here. All right, um, you can turn off if, if someone wants to turn off the light to help. All right, really the the three things. Two things that we're uh, most interested in here is the syllabus and uh, the modules. Syllabus, you're expected to read this um, on your own completely. Um, my aim is just to hit sort of the high points of the syllabus. I don't aim to cover every word because that that wouldn't be good for anyone. All right, I just I just intend to go over um, the the highlights. Uh, of this. Um, the top part, the part that's visible now, really is sort of a summary of the different ways that you can get a hold of me. And the point that I'm trying to, to, to illustrate here is that there's a lot of different ways to get a hold of me. All right. Uh, one of your key responsibilities as a student is to let me know if you're having difficulty with something. Now, these classes aren't that big. There's maybe a dozen people in this class, which is good. You know, you can get some individual attention. And if you have a question, and a couple other people are likely to have the same question, then that constitutes a substantial portion of the class. So please feel free to ask uh, any questions that you have. So you can certainly at any time in class stop and ask me a question. Worst case scenario, if I don't think that it is uh, something that I want to talk about during the lecture, if it's something maybe that relates specifically to a problem that you're working on, or whatever, I'll tell you that we'll talk about it in lab. That's sort of the worst case scenario. Um, you can contact me via phone, uh, but that's sort of not the recommended way. Uh, but my phone number is listed here if you would need to get a hold of me. Um, it's better to contact me via email, and you can generally contact me via email at my regular LC account or uh, through Canvas. 
through Canvas probably is slightly preferred simply because uh, I, in my LC email account, I get tons of emails, many of which aren't particularly relevant. So I'm, I'm more apt to overlook something if it comes to my LC account. Um, if you do email, you know, it, it, you know, be sure that you, um, you know, have a meaningful subject line um, so that I can, uh, I can understand uh, what the, what the, you know, what the source of it is. It's also good, by the way. I, I haven't. I'm trying to think if I've had this problem recently. I really haven't, but it's probably worth bringing up. Say, so, you know, um, if your regular email is like. Um, Dragon Slayer 316, whatever. That's fine. I don't really care. But, you know, sign up for a free Gmail account that, that looks more professional. Um, so, so I know. I, and I don't even remember them at the time, but there were some emails like back in the old days when I think people thought, like, gee, I can only have one email account, that, like, there are some things I don't really need to know about students that their emails revealed to me and and it's kind of like nah, I don't I, that isn't good for anyone uh, so so again um, sign up for uh, an email account uh, and again that's good like if you're looking for a job or whatever to have a professional sounding email account uh, my office hours are Monday and Wednesday 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. And also Tuesday and Thursday, immediately following this class, 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Or arranged. By arranged, I mean that, you know, if you can't make any of those times, if, you know, you have to leave right after lab to go to work or whatever, um, you know, we can talk about it. We can figure out some other time that is, is mutually agreeable. All right. Um, as far as office hours go, we can meet in person discuss over the phone or Skype or online chat. All right. Uh, I do have my Skype ID there. Again, I would ask you um, to let me know if you're planning on requesting, um, you know, a connection on Skype. Um, that way I know it's you and, and not some spam Skype account. Um, another thing that, that is, is a policy of mine is that you're welcome to come into my other classes labs all right so this is the only section of, of this class but I have a couple other classes on Monday and Wednesday uh, and they have labs just like this class does from 10 to 11 and then I have another lab from 2 to 3 all right and you're welcome to come in those for assistance. And I invite people in my other classes to come in and sit on your lab. So if you see someone in lab that doesn't look like they're in the class, they might be from one of my other classes. And I make that offer to online students as well. All right. So um, generally speaking, the lab time is your time to work on your assignments. Um, it is possible I will have an activity for lab on some days. But sort of the default is that it's your time to work on whatever you need to relating to this class. Um, and, and therefore, I generally just sit at the front and wait for questions. And I can answer questions from other people in other classes. So, you know, you can come in and sit on those, on, on those labs. Um, if nothing else, if none of this works, contact me and we'll figure something out. All right. Again, my aim here is sort of remove the excuses. You know, if you say, well, gee, I have a question, but I can't make it on campus. Well, fine, we can Skype. Um, I can't make it during your office hours. Well, can you make it to one of my lab hours? Um, and, and so on. So I try to remove any excuse that you have for not being able to have time to, to ask questions. This, of course, is in addition to asking questions during our regular lecture and regular lab course, because those are also a great time for you to ask questions. All right, next part of the syllabus relates to sort of an overview of the class. There's no text for this class. I will post some online materials. Um, 
I guess I've been bold <laughs> in a few cases where, um, you know, I recognize that textbooks are expensive and I will, you know, for some of my classes, if there's a text that I think is good, I'll recommend it. Otherwise, there's, there's tons of material that, that's available online um, and, and we can take advantage of that. Uh, in addition to the resources I post, um, there is a service uh, through LC's library called Safari Books Online, uh, which is a valuable source of um, full, full text uh, technical books. So uh, you can access it. If, if you're uh, on campus, it automatically knows that you're on campus and, and it allows you access to it. If you're off campus, you can supply your library card and, and access it that way. But I might as well pull that up here. If you go to our library's website, under research databases, click on S. The top one is Safari Books Online. And, pardon me? Oh. oh, outside? Figures. I could probably hear them talking outside, but won't be able to hear people in this classroom. Um, ASP.net, let's say. You could do a search for. And it will show you a lot of resources. And these are full text. So, I don't know, we can pick a topic. And you can read everything about that particular topic. All right. So these are full text books. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, different people. Some people like reading um, on a computer screen. Other people don't. Um, at the very least, this gives you a chance to like look at a book and try it before maybe you go to Amazon and order it. So, and it's not even like trying it like a sample. You can literally read the whole book and, and look through the whole book and see if it's valuable. And if that's enough for you, if, that, if you're comfortable reading uh, online, you have that. Otherwise, um, otherwise um, you know, you could go then and order it if you're interested. But that's a great resource. I will be posting resources, depending on the topic, um, to Angel. In a uh, not to Angel. I'll be posting them to Angel and no one will be able to read them because we don't use Angel anymore. I'll be posting them to Canvas and you'll be able to read them. Um, summary of my approach, I, you know, this is your class. Um, how do I want to say? It doesn't do me good, it doesn't do anyone any good for me to cover something if people don't understand it. So, you know, we have certain topics I want to get through, but not just get through them in the sense that I can check them off my list and say, yeah, I talked about database design or whatever. People don't understand it, then really me going through it doesn't matter. So it's not about what I lecture on, it's about what you absorb and what you understand and what you can use. So therefore, uh, keep in mind it's your class. My job is to prepare materials, assignments, lectures, activities, to help you understand the material. Your job, of course, is to, to show up, is to review the materials that I post, uh, review the examples, and probably as important as anything uh, to, um, to um, 
ask questions when you when you have issues. There's a whole list of college policies. Oh, before we get into that, Canvas will be used extensively in this class. Uh, you know, you'll turn everything in via Canvas. Um, you should probably check Canvas a couple times a week, even if you don't like have anything to turn in or whatever. Um, you know, check between classes um, and and check you know over the weekend at, at least once or twice. Um, on occasion, people ask me questions that I don't have an answer for, or I may have a hard time with an example I'm working on. You know, get flustered, not you know, and have a mistake in it that I'm not able to see. Uh, typically, what I do then is I correct them and then post the corrections uh, or answer the question that someone asked that I didn't originally know the answer to or whatever. Uh, in addition, like if class were to be canceled for any reason, um, I would post it to Canvas. Um, so, um, or clarifications if if I, you know, if I made a typo in an, in an assignment, you know, had the wrong due date or or whatever and someone brings it to my attention, I'll post the corrections as an announcement on Canvas. All right, there's a whole slew of college policies that you should, um, you know, that, that I'm not going to cover because they're covered elsewhere, um, but just to bring you to your attention uh, that these exist. Instructor policies as far as late assignments go, I aim to be flexible as far as late assignments go. I, I understand that people have all sorts of responsibilities. Um, and as such, it doesn't bother me if something's not turned in precisely at the deadline. With a couple of footnotes there, all right. Um, It doesn't bother me when I see people are putting forth an effort, when I see people attending a class, when I see people attending labs, when I see people working on things, when I see people asking me questions or emailing me questions, and I see that there's some effort being made. It doesn't bother me if something comes up in your personal life and you don't need to tell me in great detail what that is, but you could just say I had a family situation I had to take care of and this lab will be turned in a couple days late. That's fine. That doesn't bother me at all. Um, a couple additional thoughts on that, though. What, what does bother me is when people literally disappear and simply don't turn things in until a month or two later. And not, it's not like they're asking me questions, or it's not like they told me that they had to go out of town or whatever. Um, but they just don't turn stuff in and then just towards the end of the semester start trickling in some of the labs. That bothers me, you know. Um, and I'm apt to deduct points for that. The other thing I would say is that if you're late sort of on an exception basis, in other words, it happens a couple times a semester, that's one thing. If you're habitually late and you continue to turn stuff in late, then that's a sign that there is some sort of issue. Maybe you need to spend more time working on the course. Or maybe there's something that I need to go over with you that, that you don't really understand that wasn't clear. So consider, you know, um, being late, not because of an exception, but as, as a, a routine. Uh, consider that as a sign that there's something that we probably should talk about and figure out a strategy to get you back on track. So the bottom line is I reserve the right to deduct points if your assignment's late. Um, again, if you keep me in the loop and you're asking questions and I see effort made, I'm liable not to deduct at all. That's sort of the point of this section. There's a project that is worth 30 points. There's a homework uh, taken together that's worth 70 points and that comprises 100 points. Now, if for whatever reason we don't have exactly 70 points, you'll be, it'll be prorated. So, for example, if we only ended up with 65 points of homework, I'll multiply your score by 70 over 65, and that will give you the points for homework. Uh, the project is done in two sections. There's a design, uh, and then there's a final 
version of the project that you turn in. I believe the design is worth 10 points and the final project is worth 20 points. All right. Don't pay attention to these chapters because we don't have a book. I will revise this. I thought I'd taken care of everything, but I guess I let that one slip through the cracks. Questions? All right. Next, the modules. There'll be a module for every week. And that module will contain an assignment, and it will also contain um, the equivalent of handouts or, or links or, or material for you to review. So we'll look at week one's stuff in a minute here. The rest of the weeks aren't published yet, so you will not be able to see them. But, ah, the semester project. We won't talk about the semester project today other than to say that you will have one. All right, so you will have a semester project. There are not exams in this class. Class, uh, my course is either there's a project or there's a, a, a couple of tests. So in this, in this uh, case, um, there's a project. And the project is to, to be done in two parts, a design and uh, the final copy. Um, as, as anyone has had me before uh, knows, uh, one thing that I'm very big on is planning your work before you do it, to, to think it through, um, so that you have sort of a plan of attack of what you need to do, how you're going to do it, and so on. And that's sort of what the design represents. And then the finished project is sort of bringing it all together and, and executing the plan. Um, we'll talk about this more uh, a few weeks into the semester, um, but um, you should read the instructions um, right away and may maybe start thinking about um, topics for a project. All right. Under week one, we have something that I give out in all my classes, or most all of my classes, what's called a fair use handout. Fair use guide. Um, what this relates to is, in an educational context, how much material you're allowed to use from other sources. All right. Um, one, how do I want to put this? One thing that's bad about sort of internet culture is that copyright is often not respected. All right? In other words, you know, people will take pictures and post it to their website without giving any thought of whether they're legally allowed to do that or not. All right? That's how it is. Um, but in this class, my aim is not to teach how it is, but to teach, you know, the right way to do it, the legal way to do it. Um, so, for example, strictly speaking, even if you had a fan site for Star Wars, let's say, and you're just a fan, you're not even making any money off of it, you would not be allowed to take a, a photograph off of StarWars.com and put it on your website. That's, strictly speaking, a copyright violation. All right? Now, would they complain about it? Would you be able to get away with it? That's another question. In the, uh, there are different rules, however, when you're in an educational environment. An educational environment, think of creating a web page as being similar to creating a term paper. Can you use materials from other resources when you're writing a term paper? Yes. But what? But you've got to give credit. All right. So if I were to quote a book or uh, a magazine article or something about a topic, I can do that, provided I 
give credit and say, well, these aren't my words. The, these words come from such and such book. And it's sort of the same thing on a website. Um, and you're additionally restricted about how much you can take. So for example, if I had a video, I would be allowed to take uh, whichever is last, 10% or three minutes of the video. So if there was a 90 minute video, I could take three minutes of it. All right. If there was a nine minute video, I could take 54 seconds of it. All right. And so on down the line. All right. So you're limited about how much you can take, and you're limited uh, to the fact that you have to cite the source. So like, we'll have some cases where you will want to use photos um, uh, on, on your web pages. And that's fine. You don't have to take them all. But just give credit where credit is due and cite your sources. This does bring up a, an interesting thing. Uh, that, that I think is worth mentioning now, that the focus of this class is sort of on the server-side scripting, sort of on sort of the behind-the-scenes code that exists with dynamic websites. That being said, we don't want to forget everything that we know about good web design. All right? So we want your pages to look complete and professional-looking. Now, what does that mean? I know we can argue that and all that, but again, um, spend some effort uh, designing the page and making the page look good, making the page easy to use. All right. Um, there are times in class, and again, this is a horrible thing to say. You know, don't do as I say, or do do as I say. But there are times in class where simply due to the interest of time, I'm going to rush through and I'm going to show you how to code something, and I won't necessarily spend time making it look pretty. Well, part of your job on the assignment is to go the extra mile and, and to, to make it look good as well. All right. So even though the focus of this class is sort of on the coding aspect of it and the behind the scenes, back end sort of stuff, don't forget everything that you know about good web design principles. How many of you have had CISS 216 in here? All right. Most all of you? OK, that's fine. Um, those of you that don't, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, again, you could, you know, it's pretty easy to pick up. Um, and, and, you know, you could, uh, I can help you out with some HTML and CSS things um, to help you create web pages that are good. All right. These two things, um, I'll leave for you to read. Consider this to be your textbook uh, reading assignments. Um, one thing is the way that Canvas is set up. On occasion, you will see errors like this. Simply click that, and it will open it up in another tab. So read through this and read through ASP.NET Overview. All right. Are there any questions over any of that stuff? Oh, and your first assignment's in there, too, and we'll talk about that probably um, towards the end of class, in maybe 20 minutes or so. All right, I'm going to put two words up on the board, two words that could be used to describe websites. And I'd like someone to describe what they mean. Yeah. Dynamic and static. What does that? What, what do these words mean uh, with regards to websites or web pages? Dynamic means that it uses some form of scripting. What was 
like the last phrase as the user uses this. Okay. All right, I'm going to put a couple keywords down from that. Scripting. And you said change? Yeah. I mean, everything you said was good, but I just want to highlight some of, some of these things. Um, anything else? What would you say most websites consist of? Dynamic or static? Dynamic. Dynamic. It's, it's almost difficult to find examples of static sites, sites uh, anymore that are completely 100% static. In fact, I had that as an assignment, I think, in one of my classes, find static sites. And I dropped that assignment like a few years back because like just about any site that you have has some aspect of dynamic. So, static sites are typically done in HTML. Let me rephrase that, HTML only. And are unchanging unless manually changed. <laughs> now one thing to keep in mind, all right. When I make statements, you can almost assume that there are some exceptions to that. You know, so, you know, like I say, static is HTML only. Well, that's not entirely true. You know, there's CSS involved, and you could have some JavaScript and so on and so forth. All right. But so, so, so take for the most part everything I say as like being general statements and not, not we're not going to split hairs and say, well, here's a site that's static and it has a, yeah, okay, fair enough. All right. Now, when I talk about a web page changing, and again, we're talking about changing without manually intervening, right? So if you had a, uh, if those of you that had CISS 216, if you, had on your thumb drive all your assignments that you turned in. If you went back and looked at them today, they would look exactly the same as the day that you turned them in. All right? That's what I mean by unchanging. Now, you could go in and change it, but it's going to take manual intervention to go in and change it. And we used HTML in that class and CSS and a little bit of JavaScript, perhaps. When I talk about a web page changing, what do I mean? How do web pages change? Changed based on what? Information Okay, number one, information provided. To the site. What will be an example of that? Username and password. All right. Username and password. Um, what will be another example of that? Location. Location. What will be another example of that? Stock market. Stock market. I'm going to say information from an external source. And the stock market would be one example of that. Any other way that a site can change? expand it. Data that you enter on, on, on a form. For example, if I search for ASP.net in Google, I'm going to get a different set of results than if I search for PHP in Google. Right? Going to the same page, I'm getting different results. So the page changed based on what I typed into a form. And that's a classic example. All right? 
Um, could change based on time, date, or, and or time of the day. For example, if I went to um, Elsie's homepage and looked at the calendar, it would show me the event scheduled for this week. If I come back next week and look, it's going to show me the events that are scheduled for next week. If I went and, and looked at a TV network, for example's website, it might show me what's on now. If I come back in two hours, it's going to show me what's on at that time, and so on. So the date, time of the day, any other way that it could change, yes. Excellent. The device that you're viewing it on. All right. In other words, am I viewing it on a mobile or am I viewing it on a, 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 desk, a mobile device or a desktop? It can change. And then the resolution of that device. Yeah, and it can even go a lot deeper than that. The kind of device. You know, am I viewing it on a tablet versus a phone? Am I viewing it on a flip phone versus a smartphone? Am I viewing it on Android versus uh, an Apple phone, whatever those are called? Um, if I'm viewing it on a Mac versus a PC, all right? Um, sometimes if you go to a page, a page is smart enough to know that I'm on a Mac. So the download link will download the Mac version of the application. If I go to that same page, on a Windows device, it'll give me the Windows download instead of the Mac download. Um, this is a good list. Um, to summarize, this is sort of this is sort of a how do I want to say? This is sort of a uh, catch-all for everything information that the site has. And these are certain ways that the site has that information. All right. So how does it have the username and password? You type that in. Do you always have to type in your username and password? No. Um, if you don't, how does it know who you are? Based on a cookie. All right. Your location. How does it know your location? How does a website know, know your location? ISP. Okay, IP address. Okay, it actually can know it based on two different ways. One way is it can know it is based on your IP address. Your IP address is when you send a request for a web page through the internet. You know, it's it, it's letting the server know who to send the result back to you, well, back to. All right, and IP addresses are assigned to internet service providers. All right, so I have Time Warner uh, internet provider uh, in Northeast Ohio, so I go and Google Italian restaurants. It knows that I'm in a certain location, and therefore it shows me Italian restaurants that live that are there close to where I live. All right. Um, actually, with HTML5. There's a way that if it is a uh, device that has a GPS, you can actually get the precise location of it. In other words, um, in the mobile web development class, which unfortunately didn't run this semester, um, we can write applications with web pages that will tell us exactly where we are, that we are in, and this is a web page, that we are in the BU building here at LC, and we can put a marker. And it, it's fun in that class, and it's scary. We can walk around holding our web page, and the web page shows that we have moved uh, here and there. And we can do calculations to say how far we are from this, that, or the other. All right? So it knows your location based on either your IP address or if you're GPS enabled, and you, and you have given permission. That's the other catch. You have to say, yeah, you can, you can track by location. Then it will know precisely where you are. 
Uh, information from an external source, usually that's very specialized. That might be things like the stock market, as was mentioned. That might be a site that connects to a weather service, for example, that can take the location, all right, and go to the National Weather Service and pull the weather forecast data for it and display it on the screen. From a form, that's probably the most straightforward one. When you do a Google search, you type in the form, I want to search on PHP or ASP.net, and it brings it up for you. Date and time, this is almost a trick question here, right? That seems pretty obvious. That's going to be based on the system clock. Well, whose system clock? Well, it depends. It could either be the server system clock or it could be the clock of the device All right, that, that's making a request. So in other words, if I were to go to the BBC site right now, it might show me that it is, let's see if my math and my geography is right, it may show me that it's 4 p.m., right? Because in the UK right now it's 4 p.m., near as I know. All right. Or it could show me it's 11 a.m., depending on if it looked at where I was and what the time zone I was in. It could adjust the time, or it could show the time on the server. And the device running, of course, is information that comes. Now, all of this information comes when the client makes a request to the server. Anytime the client makes a request to the server, this information is sent. Now, whether the server does anything with that information is another issue. But whenever the client makes a request to the server, that information is correct. So let's draw a diagram that I'll probably have up here many times throughout the uh, semester. Client making requests through the internet to the server. Now, in the case of static web pages, we're talking about plain old HTML pages. Like if you would imagine the web pages you created in CISS 16, if you put them out on a web server somewhere, there'd be a set of files that would be contain HTML and CSS and maybe just a wee bit of JavaScript. When the client makes a request, they send a whole request package over. First of all, it contains the URL that the, that the client is, is, is requesting. So the address of the page. So maybe you know, maybe we're requesting www.olympics.org slash Ryan Lotke. All right. Now, if this were a static page, .html, let's say. Now, if this were a static page, the server's job would be easy. The server would simply find that HTML document and any associated CSS, JavaScript images, and it would send it back to whoever requested it. So the client would get back HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Again, one of the other things that would go with this request package is the IP request, uh, IP address, so that, the, so that the internet knows where to route the response. Now, these these are two key concepts in client-server web programming. Request and response. A client makes a request, a server responds with a response. 
the response is going to be a web page. It's going to be HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and maybe some other associated files, like images and so on. Now, the response could be an error page saying that such URL doesn't exist. You know, if I went to www.olympics.org slash MikeZellers.html, all right, there is no such page, and therefore it would respond back, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. And it would give me a, a 404 error page. But the response is what the server responds to the client. The request is what the client sends. So the request is going to contain the URL and the IP address and a whole bunch of other stuff. All right? And in the case of a static web page, all the server does is take that request, find the URL, uh, or find the files associated with that URL, and send it back to the client. The analogy that I always give for this would be like ordering a Big Mac at, at McDonald's, right? You order a Big Mac as opposed to a fish sandwich or a cheeseburger or whatever. What does the server do? The server turns around finds a bin that has a Big Mac, grabs one, and gives it to you. All right? It's pre-made. It's sitting there waiting for someone to ask for it. The server doesn't do anything. It's already been assembled, and the server simply grabs it and gives it to you. That's the case of a static page. All right? Now, in the case of dynamic pages... The server has a lot more responsibility. First of all, if you remember, when I first asked about dynamic pages, the student responded with the fact that scripts are used. Scripts are little programs, all right? that aren't just HTML the saying what the output's going to look like, but instructions on how to create the output. So if I went to Canvas, let's say, I would supply the URL I want as part of my request. I would supply the IP address, who to send the results to. But if I was logging into Canvas, I would also supply some data, namely my username and password. So that would come as part of the request that the client sent the server. All right. The server then is going to do some things, and there's a script, there's a program that controls this. Because we're not talking about getting a page that's going to look the same for everyone. My home page in Canvas looks very different than your home page in Canvas. Mine shows the courses that I am involved with this semester. More than that, though, it gives I have special permission that you don't. You know, I can enter grades for CISS 243. Uh, you can't. All right. So the courses are on the page, and the options that I have on each page are different based on the fact that I'm an instructor and you're a student in this class. So there is a script, or programs, that take a look at who the person is, more than likely pull from a database. In this case, it would certainly pull from a database. See if, first of all, that the person was a valid user, so it would validate their user ID and password, make sure that that was legit. It would then pull up a list of courses, identify the role the instructor had in the, or the person had in each of the courses, and construct a home page dynamically. All right, would piece together pulling data from the database. And following the rules as defined in the script, it would piece together a web page. So in other words, it's not like static web pages. You don't have a Canvas homepage sitting on the server. 
waiting for you to ask for it. There's a script that can produce anyone's Canvas page, provided you give the credentials. And that script interacts with the database and pieces together, dynamically creates on the fly a web page for that particular person. And again, it's dynamic. We had a great example yesterday of a student in my 216 class who had like just registered um, for the class. At the start of the lab, it didn't show on Canvas. By the end of the lab, it did show on Canvas. Why? Because someone over in whatever department had finally updated the database. And therefore, the next time they request the page, they saw CISS 216 was added. What's more, it could be even more sophisticated, like if I were to take a course myself, if I took a art history class or something like that, it would know the fact that in that class I'm a student, so it wouldn't allow me to enter grades for that class, just the classes that I was the instructor for. Now here's an important thing to remember. The response coming back to a client, regardless of its static or dynamic, is going to be a web page. Therefore, it is going to be a mix of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, going back to our food analogy, I said that static pages were like going to McDonald's and ordering a Big Mac. Server doesn't do anything, just turns and grabs a Big Mac that's already been prepared. All right? Think of dynamic pages as being like going to a Subway and ordering a Subway sandwich. When you go to Subway, you first say what kind of bread you want. You then say, like, what kind of sandwich you want. Uh, do you want it toasted? What kind of cheese do you want? What kind of vegetables, toppings, and so on you want? And when you're done, everyone has their own sandwich, custom made for them and them alone. Now, could you imagine if Subway tried to work like McDonald's, where they would have, like, about a million bins. Well, this is an Italian BMT on white bread with provolone. The next one is a, a, a BMT with um, on wheat bread with provolone. Then wheat bread and Swiss. Then wheat bread and or white bread and Swiss. You know, it would be totally infeasible to do that. There's too many combinations. Just like we're not going to have web developers here at LC creating a static web page for each person here that has just their stuff. I mean, that would be unworkable. All right? What the Subway server has instead is it has a set of instructions and gets input as requested by the customer, by the client, and uses that information along with their recipe and their knowledge of how to make a sandwich to construct a sandwich just for them. But, again, keep in mind, when you leave, you leave with a sandwich, whether you left, go to McDonald's or go to Subway, right? Just as in the case of whether it's a static or dynamic page, the client gets sent a page that contains HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. All right. Now, this is a way that all client-side scripting works, all right? We're going to study ASP.NET, all right? But there's a lot of other kinds of platforms, let's say, that server-side scripting exists on. What's another example of a server-side scripting platform besides ASP.NET? Python. Python. PHP, Perl, if you want to go back, old school, um, Ruby on Rails, um, and so on. Conceptually, they all work this way. They take the request, they do something with that request to make the page look different for each request. If we consider Google searching. Google searching 
you don't necessarily, I mean, you could be logged into your Google account, but you don't necessarily have to be logged into your Google account. But what do you have instead? You have a form that you enter into that contains what you're searching for. All right. Some of the other things on this would include what's called your user agent. That would be the, the in other words, the browser that you're using. Um, the hardware that you're using, the operating system that you're using. All these things happen automatically when an HTTP request is made. When your browser, when a client running a web browser makes a request, all this information is set. Again, whether the server does anything with that information is another issue. All right, but all of it is set. Okay, so our platform is ASP.NET. All right. I want to put up a key few, set of a few key words associated with ASP.NET and what we're going to do in this class. And let's make sure that we understand what these mean. Should make you buy it, but we're not really. We don't have. We don't have Vanna and Pat here, so we'll 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 let it go. There is an A here. I gotta make sure I'm spelling this right. That'd be horrible. H. H. No H. Something to start with. And 
So ASP.NET is a library. Of, all right, so ASP.NET is a library of classes. We can think of these as building blocks. Or we can think of these as components. You know, if you imagine back like a long, long time ago, right? You know, what was, what was one of the things Henry Ford was known for? Creating uh, an assembly line. And, and boy, I, I don't remember this. It was, it was back in the, the system of interchangeable parts, right? Where you know, it used to be in the old days, like craftsmen would make everything from scratch, right? So if you had to make a table, right, you would go and you would, I don't, I don't, I have no idea how to make a table, but you would do all those things from beginning to end each time. Whereas, a smarter way to do it is you got a bunch of legs, you got a bunch of tabletops, and you just put them together. You don't have to craft each leg individually. You have a bunch of these legs cranked out by some process. You have a bunch of these tabletops, and then you just put them together. Now, the nice thing there is, is I can make variations in it, right? I can make a little table or a big table because the legs are probably going to be the same, right, on a big table and a little table. I just take my legs, and if I attach them to a big tabletop, I got a big table. If I attach them to a little tabletop, I got a little table. But the idea is, in that case, I had a framework. I had some parts that I assembled to make my finished product. Think of ASP.NET as a library of classes, and these classes are building blocks, components that provide a framework for you to make web applications. What is C Sharp? It's a programming language. So really, we're going to use the terminology correct, which we should. ASP.NET isn't a programming language. All right, it's ASP.NET is a set of components. That and what do we use C# -sharp for in an ASP.NET application? Putting our components together. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Put the components together. Customize the components. You know, we might have, for example, and we do in ASP.NET, we might have a grid component. The component that contains a grid of data. Well, if you log in, that grid should show your classes. If I log in, that grid should show my classes. What does that? Well, C sharp can be the thing responsible for doing that sort of customization. What is Visual Studio then? It is software. What's the specific term for this kind of software? Pardon me? IDE. IDE. I was going to say, do I have to do Wheel of Fortune for this one? IDE uh, stands for Integrated Development Environment. You know, think of it as your workbench and so on. It's how you create these things. Now, how many of you have used Visual Studio before? I'd imagine most of you. How many of you have used Visual Studio to create web pages? All right. What I'd like to do with the first five minutes of lab, which started two minutes ago, <laughs> all right, is show you how I would like you to create the web page for your first lab assignment. Your first lab assignment is simply to create a page that shows information about some of the topics that we're going to cover in this course. Um, I can't remember what they are, but ASP.NET, uh, database design, and something else. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you how I would like you to create it. All right. Because this assignment should be pretty simple for you to do. I would think that anyone that did CISS 216 could whip this out in a couple minutes, right? But I want to use this not just as a, uh, to, to create the content, uh, but to, to get you familiar with using 
uh, ASP.NET to create um, web pages. So, we're going to Visual Studio. I'm going to go up here and say file, new, website. It's going to ask me some questions. We are going to want to, at least for the first, example, start out with a empty, for the first few examples, we're going to start out with an empty website. ASP.NET empty website. We're going to choose where we want to put it. So I'm going to, for simplicity, I'm going to put it on the desktop. And I'll call it example one. All right. We are going to be using Visual C Sharp in this course, so we'll make sure that Visual C Sharp is checked or, or highlighted there. And then we we're going to click OK. It does its thing. It creates an empty website, just like it said it would. And empty, how do I want to say this? It creates an empty website, but it does give us one file that's absolutely necessary, and that's a web config file. And we can double click on it and see it. And this is a configuration file for um, our application. If we look out on the desktop, we will see there's a file or the folder that I created, the, the website, and inside it is the web config and web de debug config. So even a, an empty website has two files in it. All right. So I've done that. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to cl click on File, New, File. And I'm going to click, again, for now, we're not going to click HTML page like you might think. We're going to click web form. And, again, Visual C Sharp. Default.aspx is by default the name. That will by default be your website's home page. So keep it as that. All right. And there's a couple of checkboxes here. Place code in a separate file. You want that to be checked. Even though we're not going to use that in this assignment, it's a good habit to get into. Lastly, where it says select master page, we're not doing anything with that now, so leave it unchecked. And I click add. There's my page. And we're not going to talk about the design part yet, but design allows you to drag and drop. But you can go in and you can create your web page. And what you'll do is do what we, you know, the assignment asked for. Provide uh, information about, I think, ASP.NET, database design, and SQL. You can create a style sheet and add it to it by just going file, new, file, CSS, and so on. When you want to test it, you can go and click debug, and it will open it up in your default browser.
after it spends a long time thinking about it. All right, there you go. Now, if you come back the next day and you want to continue to work on it, all right, and this is important because when you go to leave, close, you can close out of that, what would you take? You would take this folder. The folder that contains the web config is going to contain all of your files. How would you open that up the next day? You would go to Visual Studio. And you'd click Open, Website, and then you would find that folder and click Open. And then you're back to where we left off. So I want you to create your page this way. And when you're done, you're going to need to zip up this folder and give it to me. So it's not just going to be one page you're going to give me. You're going to give me, like, minimally four files. De Default.aspx, default.aspx.cs, even though there's nothing in it, all right? Your web config, even though we haven't ch touched it, and the web debug config. All right, and then again, if you add CSS or images or whatever, that will, that will, there'll be more files still. But you need to give me the whole folder. So that's how I want you to create this assignment. Are there any questions? All right, uh, we'll see you over in lab. All right, what I'm going to do is I'll go over there and unlock it, and then I'll come back here to grab the files so I can post them. Um,